It's Brian Preston, the money guy. So let's talk about 30s, because this is when you are likely buying your first home. We actually did the research. We're nerdy enough, and we said, what's the average age in the United States that people buy their first home? And we found out it's around 33 years of age. And I got to believe that uh, it just stands to reason mathematically, if that's the average and prices are appreciating, homes are getting more expensive, I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't see that number even tick up a little bit further because homes are getting more expensive. They're harder to get into. Well, and, and a lot of this, we, we told you, there's multiple things. The pandemic with people moving mm -hmm. all over the country is one cause, but there's also super low interest rates. This is making a lot of things affordable. And we wanted to kind of put together an illustration to show you why does this impact things so much? And, and look, here's the experience share I have. My first home purchase in 1998, the interest rate that I celebrated, I mean, tears in my eyes so excited that I got, was six and three quarters. And so as we sit here listening to that today, that, that sounds asinine. That sounds incredible to think about a mortgage rate that's high. And I bet there are folks that are much older than you are that would say, six? I remember when my first mortgage was 13%. We ought to bottle up, and you say this to me all the time, bottle up where we are right now, because there's a chance we'll look back over the rest of our life and never see interest rates back where they are right now. So let's actually show them some numbers on how Interest rates impact affordability because it is a very, very big impact. So let's say that you're looking at buying a home. And let's say that we know that the monthly payment is going to be $1,500. You've done your 25% calculation and you've determined that your housing allowance is $1,500 per month that you can spend. Well, if one house has an interest rate on the mortgage of 6%, and the other house has an interest rate of 2.5%, you would probably think to yourself, oh, well, that's great. I just, the 2.5% sounds better. I'll pay less in interest. That's all there is to it. Well, when you actually factor in the size of the mortgage that those could substantiate, the 6% mortgage would only allow you to have a mortgage of about $251,000. Whereas the 2.5% rate means for the exact same payment, you could go out and buy a house with a mortgage of $380,000. Again, you did not spend any more on a monthly out-of-pocket stance, but in terms of the house you can buy, it makes a huge, huge difference. So for giggles, I went and ran my six and three quarters, mm -hmm. and, and that number comes in to be $231,000. I think that's amazing if you compare that to the 380. You essentially can buy a 50% bigger house with the exact same monthly payments, it's really wild because less money is going towards interest. Mm -hmm. More money is, you know, it's allowing you to leverage. That's a good thing, but it's also a scary thing. That's why you better understand how much can you afford from both the monthly payment, but also from the net worth statement That's side right. of things, because it's not always about the payment. It's how much debt you're taking mm -hmm. on as well. Yeah, that, that's something I think that's really uh, interesting. I've, I've recognized a lot of my peers have said, man, with interest rates this low, I can just afford to go buy a much, much, much bigger house. You know, I, because interest law I can afford. And like, yeah, is that really the best decision? Do you want to buy a much bigger house than you need, a much more expensive house than you need? Because remember, in our example, the total debt was $130,000 larger, even though the payment was the same. Are you sure that you're in a situation where you want to incur an extra $130,000 of debt? simply because you can. No doubt. And then I think that this is another contrarian thing about interest rates and debt is that low interest rates actually create more access to buying housing, sure. meaning yep. access. Because think about it, somebody who can only afford $800 a month or $1,000 a month, um, there's more people that's going to let you buy more house. Right. But And Daniel and I were talking about this when we were kind of nerding out on some stuff. He did this deep dive, and he's got this whole series that's going to be coming out. We'll be announcing this. I think we're even going to be collecting email addresses starting this Friday on FYIFTE, meaning FYI Daniel's going to FTE, start yeah. writing blog posts. And one of the things that he, he did a whole blog post on was education. Mm -hmm. And education, we found out in 1978, some, some legislation passed that made education much more – it was proposing to make it more affordable. Okay. It, it opened up access – same thing happened. Prices of education mm -hmm. shot. Same thing with this. Interest rates are so low. So you think, you know what? This is going to create more access, more people. But no, what it does is it creates a it run. Prices. It drives demanding. You guys know 
supply and demand, if you have a limited supply, tons of demand, what does it do? It shoots price up the price. Up. So a lot of people are paying a lot more for a house than they would have mm -hmm. two or three years ago when interest rates were a little bit higher. So don't let the siren song of low interest rates cause you to make that decision. So, okay, when it does come time to buy a house and you are doing that, what are some of the things that you can you should consider? And we get this all the time. Hey, I'm thinking about buying a house. What are some of the things I should think about? Well, here's the first one. And, and I don't want to say that this is the most important one, but it's got to be somewhere really, really close to the top of the list. You really ought to think about how long you plan on being in that area. Because when you make a real estate purchase, it's an illiquid asset. I mean, right now it doesn't seem that way because houses are selling so fast and going up in value so fast. But in normal times, it's not the easiest thing in the world to buy and sell real estate. Plus, there's a ton of costs associated with it, with closing costs and real estate commissions and that sort of thing. So our rule of thumb is that you don't actually want to buy a house. You don't want to set roots unless you can feel pretty comfortable. You're going to be in that location and want to be in that house for at least five to seven years. Five. That is such a big part of it because I hear people you move around every two to three years. You would think your your father or mother was a Methodist well, pastor. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's, that's, that's the joke in my neighborhood because we had a parsonage in my old neighborhood when I was a kid, is that you move around. That's always hard, mm -hmm. um, especially with everything that Bo just shared. So five to seven years, if you're looking for when you're trying to just say, what are the things that I need to be thinking about this house purchase? Time is probably the most important thing in your checklist Make sure you're in the city, in the area, and your job is where mm -hmm. you think it's, it's going to support this. Don't neglect that five, and dis, five to seven year commitment. And then the other thing too is make sure that this house makes sense for where you think your family situation might look like five to seven years from now. Because if you buy a house at this stage of life, but perhaps you're not married and you don't have kids and you haven't gotten all the dogs or whatever the thing is, is this a house that's still going to make sense for my family situation as that changes over the next five to seven years as well? And I, and I got one other little tidbit on this is that we're in a crazy time. Interest rates are super low, lots of demand. It's driving up prices. Five to seven years is also going to give you enough time to weather any crazy weird hiccups that's there might right. be in pricing. Because yes, you might be overpaying for your community, but if you're there long enough, nobody's going to care because I promise you, even if you're overpaying now, 10 years, 15 years from now, it'll be okay. That's right. But if you had to sell in a year, two years, three years, you really might get an unfortunate mm -hmm. impact because in the short term, it's just not going to work out as well. And the, the other thing that you really want to consider is, can I afford this house over the long term? We already mentioned this, but you want to keep all of your housing expenditures less than 25% of your gross income. If you're someone who is buying that first home and you are kind of navigating into those waters, don't let yourself get out ahead of your skis because a home is something that you might carry around with you for the next 20, 25, 30 years. So you want to make sure you make that decision well. Well, uh, this one, this makes me smile, Bo, because I've you and I have known each other long enough and I love seeing life through your mm -hmm. eyes because you're getting to do things for the first time. I have been with you as you've bought your first home, yep. and I've been with you as you bought your second home. I can still remember when you bought the first house. I mean, the shock and awe that comes from oh, yeah. blinds and window coverings, uh, because, you know, the sheets over the windows only work for so long. <laughs> I think there's a little shock and awe. So as you're planning your budget, you know, because you look, your, your apartment, it comes you, with blinds yep, already there. But somehow, when, I remember when I bought my first house, I walked in, it was a brand new house you know, from this production builder. And I, I walked in, I was like, where's the toilet what? paper holders? Where, where are the, where are the towel holders? Uh -huh. Wait, what, I have to put my own towel holders up. I mean, it was kind of a shock and awe of all the things that go into making a house, a house furniture. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, furniture's expensive. Lawnmower. I, I, lawnmower. I remember you called me up. What type of ladder do you have at your house? I, did, I need, I I need like... to know what type of ladders, all these things mm -hmm. that you take for granted with home ownership. Somebody has to build this stuff. I think Target's, you know, Walmart's, Home Depot's, they have made an entire huge multi-billion dollar business out of people buying homes and having yep. to buy this stuff. So one of the things, again, we encourage you to do is make sure that you think about the total affordability of the home. It makes me so sad when we see friends and relatives 
go and use all of their cash savings and all of their emergency reserves, and they tap as much of their cash flow as they can to get into a house, and there's nothing left over for this other stuff. Yeah. They're, they, they have rooms that just sit empty and grass that Been can't there, be done gone. that. Uh, you know, maybe that's not the most prudent way to attack such that, a large financial That's incentive. called house rich, life poor. Right. We're trying to help you pr- protect yourself from that. So let's talk about how do you buy? I mean, what what is, how can you ensure that you aren't in that house rich, life poor situation? I think we give you the most latitude, the most flexibility of most financial people out there. And the fact that we don't try to shame you by telling you you have to do 20%. Dirty little secret of personal finance, Nobody here put down 20% on nope. their first home. We both put down 3 to 5%. We went and interviewed a lot of our staff here. Most people are the exact same way. So don't feel shame in the fact of on that first house, you have to get kind of creative with the down payment. 3 to 5% to get on the home ownership train. That's completely okay. But Brian, it's been ingrained in me. 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%. Yeah, 20% is an ideal. But you've already said this. In a rising real estate environment, where prices are getting more and more expensive, if you have to continue waiting until you get to 20%, two things are going to happen. There's a chance you may never actually get to the house because prices keep going up and keep going up and you're just chasing that car that you can't quite get to. And the other thing is your army of dollar bills is not getting put to work. If everything you're doing for the first 10 years of your career, the first 15 years is moving towards your down payment, there are a lot of soldiers that are not working for you. So give yourself a break, take a step back, Focus on doing three to five percent down. Still keep the monthly amount inside of twenty five percent, and it's okay to have that kind of grace on your first home. I love that because that's go. It is going to let you have some life. It's going to let you not only be able to spend time mm-hmm. with the family, but from time to time, you're also going to be able to fund that Roth that's IRA exactly and get the right. tax free growth and all those things. Well, look. We didn't think this was good enough. We, we were talking about this in pre show playing. We're like, okay, buying a home. What if you're in one of those unique markets? Like Nashville is, where, guys, houses, I'm telling you, I could lean right over here. I could lean three two-by-fours against this wall, tell somebody it's for sale, and we'd have 12 contracts on it just because that's the way the real estate market— Even before you listed it for sale, you'd have some pre-market I mean, it is uh, there is so much—it's comical, but it's also scary as all get out. So we were like, let's go above and beyond, and let's give some notable tips and tricks on if you are trying to make yourself stand out, how can you peacock— on buying that first house. Yeah, it's like most things in life. If you want to stand out, you have to figure out a way to stand out. Well, the first one is pretty obvious, but pretty difficult to do. It's offer cash. A lot of times, if you're someone... (laughs) I just told you, young people don't have cash. So so that's that's a harder thing to do. If you happen to be in that situation and you can pay cash for a home, that's something to make you stand out because a lot of sellers would prefer Mm -hmm. to sell to an all-cash buyer. Or if you've been shopping around for houses, you may have lost some homes to an all-cash buyer. That is a way to set yourself apart. But frankly, that's pretty hard. And that's really, really hard for young people. So what are some other ways you can make yourself stand out? Uh, You can be flexible on your terms. Like you can be willing to close quickly on the home. Yeah, you can also, I mean, think about a lot of times sellers are just as stressed out as you because maybe they're building somewhere else or they're moving to another city. And there's a lot of things they kind of have it figured out, but they might need additional flexibility on moving or dates You can give that. And if you can Mm -hmm. offer that, sometimes that additional flexibility you give the seller might make your offer stand out from the others. Yeah. Hey, I want to go ahead and buy this house, but if you need to be in there an extra month, I'm I'm fine with that. We can work something out. We can make that work. If you can do that and you're in a flexible situation, you're going to set yourself up. Now, this next one makes me a little nervous. Well, this one was cringeworthy. As we've gone through show prep, I was like, should we even put that in there? Because (laughs) this just seems, if you won't, just evidence that we might be in bubble territory. Mm -hmm. This point right here just makes my spidey senses go crazy. You could uh, waive the inspection (laughs) and the appraisal because a lot of, a lot of markets are so hot that someone said, Hey, I'll buy this house. No inspection over. That seems crazy. And we would never encourage you to necessarily go that way. But if for some reason, the property you're buying doesn't need to be inspected and doesn't need an appraisal and you're comfortable taking on that risk, it is a way to make yourself stand out, but beware because that just sounds absolutely coconuts. That does sound coconuts. That's why I'd prefer for you to make yourself stand out with something a little more personalized. Mm -hmm. And that's the last step we put in here. Look, we see this all the time in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. You've told me you've gotten like five in the last probably two or three weeks. You can always write a letter 
And then here's, here's what this letter can do for you. If you know there's a certain neighborhood you want to move to, go put them in mailboxes. Absolutely. I know that sounds just wild, but it works, guys. It's in some weird way if you have a – because a lot of neighborhoods that are in great school districts, there's just no houses for mm-hmm. sale in that area. You can go peacock by – you write in a letter, put a picture, make sure you don't feed the kids for a few <laughs> hours, put the dog there and hold out on food so they get the, the big, big hungry eyes. And, you know, take a picture, put that in the letter that just kind of shares what makes you different. And, and it's the same thing when you make offers on the houses. I mean, I, I, this is not an uncommon practice if you're trying to figure out how do I stand out? Let the seller feel like they have some type of co- emotional connection with you so that you can stand out from the rest of the pack. And now, you may say, that's crazy, guys. That's just out. No, it's, it's all about the money. It's all about the numbers. Well, we can tell you firsthand that's not the case. You know, even one of one of uh, our advisors here, Carter, when he bought his first house, he and his wife actually did this. They, they knew the exact neighborhood they wanted to be in. They took a picture of them and their dog. They have a beautiful golden noodle. This is before they had kids. And they just wrote a letter. Hey, we really want to be in this neighborhood, and we're looking for this. And he wrote that out and put it in the mailbox. Uh, and I think that's actually how it came. I know that in my neighborhood, one of the neighbors who I'm close friends with now, work out with him every morning, yeah. uh, he actually got into my neighborhood by doing this. Him and his wife and their two little girls took pictures on a postcard, wrote notes, put them in mailboxes, and it just so happened the person, one of the mailboxes they looked in, the person like, hey, I, I am thinking about selling one, reached out, got in touch, and it all worked out. That won't always work, but in this kind of market, you got to do something. Well, I think it does ultimately come down to the numbers, but it's it's not uncommon for numbers to be just a few hundred dollars off. That's right. Maybe you have two of the offers that essentially on paper look exactly the uh-huh. same. If one is more uh, you know, personalized or you feel like you have some type of emotional connection, that might be enough to tip the scales. Look, we tell the same thing to kids who are interviewing for colleges. Yep. Don't go sit with the pack. Go make yourself stand out. Be that peacock. It works in these type of markets as well. So so go out there. And, you know, we used to call this bird dogging, you know, because you essentially you are bird dogging right. your first house when you do this type of stuff. It doesn't have to be just for investors. This might be the place you raise your kids. So, so get excited about that.